So welcome everyone to this uh, first, first event in a new seminar series, War and Peace in Africa. Um, my name is Kieran Mitten. I'm a senior lecturer in the Department of War Studies at King's College London. I feel I should also mention I'm from Bradford, so it's an, a special honour to be part of this collaboration. Um, and this, this uh, series is a collaboration of the John and Elnora Ferguson Centre for African Studies, based in the Department of Peace Studies and International Development at the University of Bradford, um, together with the Africa Research Group in the Department of War Studies at King's. And it builds on um, a long history of, of, of collaboration and competition between the two departments, uh, not least on the football pitch. Um, some of you might be familiar with the Tolstoy Cup, the Battle of War and Peace. Um, and we've put this series together, uh, Dr. David Harris and myself, um, to explore some of the common interests of the departments around security, development, peace and conflict, um, obviously with a particular interest in the African continent. And today's topic um, is, is an important one, um, talking about contemporary Africa and the future trajectory of, of Africa. Um, it's China and India in Africa. And we are going to look at some case studies and we're going to take a comparative angle on this in particular. Um, before we proceed, we just wanted to um, mention that we're, we're kind of dedicating today's seminar to the memory of, of, of Ian Taylor, um, who's a professor at University of St Andrews. Many of you will be very familiar with Ian. Um, his work on, on Africa, in particular his interest on, in China and Africa, written numerous books, many articles. Um, and it's not just that, um, you know, it's his relevance of his work that we're remembering today. It's also that he was a great guy. Um, and, and for David and myself, we had lots of great conversations with Ian, uh, conferences, um, not just about academic work, but, you know, he had a great sense of humor, great taste in music. Um, so he's very much missed. So we're dedicating today's seminar to Ian. Um, and to do so, to launch us off on this series, um, I'm very pleased to introduce an excellent um, panel. Um, I'm going to introduce each panelist um, first, and this will be the order in which they're going to speak. Each panelist is going to speak for roughly around 10, 12 minutes, um, and then we will we will crack on. The way the seminar is going to work is we're going to have the presentations one after the other, um, and then we're going to have questions uh, from the audience. If you have questions, if you can type them into the dedicated question box, then when it comes to the Q&A, um, I'll go through those questions and I'll put as many as I can directly to our panel. We would really welcome comparative questions, um, questions that perhaps we can address to every single speaker and, and think about you know, the contrasts and the, and the similarities um, between the different cases mentioned. So um, let me just begin by introducing our first speaker, who is Hang Wai Li. Uh, Han Guai is a PhD candidate in politics and international studies, as well as a teaching fellow at SOAS, the University of London. And Han Guai has worked uh, as a journalist uh, previously and a researcher uh, for several years in Africa and has monitored elections in various countries, including Zambia and Malawi, as an international observer. And her research interests include a particular focus on China's political and economic engagement with Africa. And, and Han Guai is going to talk about China in Zambia. Following that presentation, we'll then hear from Dr. Oscar Mayer Otelli, um, who will speak about China in Kenya. And Dr. Otelli is a lecturer at the Department of Political Science and Public Administration at the University of Nairobi. And he's currently undertaking research on understanding Kenya's agency in the management of Chinese development finance. Uh, and his main interests are around politics and government in Kenya and African politics and China and Africa relations. We're then going to have a, a team effort. We're going to hear from uh, both Dr. Simona Vittorini and Dr. David Harris, uh, co-chair of this uh, series and um, head of the, the Eleanor Ferguson Institute. And they're going to talk about India and West Africa. Uh, Dr. Simona Vittorini is a senior lecturer in the Department of Politics and International Studies at SOAS. Um, and Dr. Vittorini specializes in South Asian politics. And the main focus of her work is on post-colonial nationalism processes of construction of collective identities and the performative and symbolic aspect of politics. She's also the author um, of Rituals, Symbols and Politics of Indian Nationalism. And together with David Harris, she's co-authored uh, a number of chapters and articles on India's expanding presence in Africa, as well as South-South cooperation. 
David Harris is a senior lecturer in African studies at the University of Bradford, and he's the director of the John and Elnora Ferguson Center for African Studies, the co-chair of this series. And he's published widely on elections and West African politics, including the book Sierra Leone of Political History. And more recently, as mentioned, he's written chapters on India-Africa relations too. Our final presenter will be Professor P.B. Anand, and he'll be talking about BRICS in Africa. Dr. Anand is Professor of Public Policy and Sustainability at the University of Bradford, and he's the head of the Department of Peace Studies and International Development. He's currently um, the PI, the Principal Investigator of a three-year British Academy project on infrastructure governance for inclusive, smart and sustainable cities, uh, working together with colleagues in India. So, without further ado, I would like to hand over to Hangwai, our first speaker, um, and um, I will leave you momentarily. Okay, um, hello everyone, and thank you so much, uh, Dr. Meaton, for the very kind introduction. And it's my pleasure to share some of my insights on China in Zambia here today. And I'd like to start from giving a short and brief introduction on China's engagement in Zambia, especially for those who don't have much background knowledge. So China and Zambia officially established diplomatic relations on October October 29, 1964, and this is just five days after Zambia achieved independence from Britain. And in the official discourse, China-Zambia relations has been described as all weather friendship by both Zambia and Chinese government officials. And even in the term of pandemic, top Chinese diplomat Yang Jiechi paid a visit in Zambia, and this was just two months ago, and, and he promised that China would continue to support Zambia. And of course, we know that and the reality is much, much more complicated. Um, many of you probably have heard how the late uh, the late pop populist politician Michael Sata played the anti-Chinese card in his presiden presidential campaigns in 2006 and also 2011. And he was calling Chinese investors rather than investors. And he was threatening to kick out all the Chinese workers from Zambia. Zambia has also been one of the top 10 destinations for Chinese investment in Africa. And China is the top investor in the country. And Chinese FDI in Zambia reached 3.5 billion US dollars in, uh, in 2018, according to the size carry database. And there is no accurate figure for the number of Chinese nationals currently, currently living in Zambia. Um, but according to my previous interviews with multiple Chinese community leaders, they estimate that there are 30,000 to 50,000 Chinese migrants in Zambia and more than uh, 1,000 Chinese companies in the country. Zambia is also one of the countries where China is the biggest bilateral creditor and a major pro provider of development finance. And I know many of us are also very concerned on Zambia's debt distress as Zambia is the uh, first African country to default on debt during COVID. And depending on different sources, Zambia currently has 25% to 30% of all its external loans owed to China, almost the same percentage as owed to the private sector via Eurobonds. In October and also November 2020, respectively, Zambia became the first country to announce and uh, deferred payments to uh, its Chinese creditors, and namely the China Development Bank and also the uh, Exim Bank. And we know that there is um, very lim limited transparency in, Chin in Chinese lending and also uh, the Chinese financial flows to Zambia, and there is also very little accurate data on loan conditions. So in this case, rumors, inaccurate information, also misinformation arose, which oftentimes led to generalization and simplification. And sometimes I think it's quite uh, striking for me to see scholars uh, are still using rumors and also false information to support their arguments. 
for example, there has been some reports in Zambia saying that China is going to take over Zambia's international airport, its national broadcasting company, ZNBC, and its state-owned electricity company, Zesco. Um, however, the truth is that Zesco and ZNBC and the airport were never provided as collateral, and Zambia has not offered any of its assets as bilateral or multilateral loans, and there were no state enterprise at risk of being repossessed. Next, I'd like to uh, maybe break down the concept of China, because we know that China is really, really a big, big concept. And when we speak about China in Africa, we often think about China, uh, the China that is central government-led, and it's it is very driven by geopolitical interests. Um, that certainly exists, but I think the reality is much, much more complicated as there is no uh, monolithic China in Africa. And even for state-owned ent uh, enterprise, they often have conflicts of interests and they are all competing and, com and keep competing fiercely. Um, for instance, in 2015, um, Zambian media reported that uh, the unhealthy competition between uh, sino Hydro, Chinese State Construction Engineering Corporation, uh, which is also called CSCC, and China Gojoba Group over the Kafil Power Station contract. And these three companies are all state-owned, but they were still competing for the same project. They were operating with a significant degree of independence from the state, and it was actually a big headache for the Chinese economic and the commercial council in Zambia, as he was not able to coordinate the financial interests and also conflicts. So I think it's also uh, worth to mention that 90% of the Chinese firms in Zambia are private firms rather than state firms. Most of these companies have no connection to the Chinese government. They have invested in many sectors, such as uh, real estate, uh, manufacturing, agriculture, service, and even gambling, a sector that is totally forbidden in mainland China. And a, a considerable number of them are small or medium-sized private firms with limited experience operating internationally. And some of you might have heard or have seen some news on labor law violations by Chinese firms. And I spoke to some of them, and oftentimes it turned out to be that these small entrepreneurs did not realize that regulations in Zambia were very different than what they were used in China. And some of the Chinese community leaders and associations have been working on some initiatives, such as translating local laws into Chinese and assisting first term Chinese investors in understanding local regulations. So in an article I published with Dr. Shi Xuefei on the social and political roles of Chinese associations in Zambia, we emphasize that it is important uh, to recognize that there are multiple Chinese actors acting the, in the country, and Chinese associations are also, are, um, also uh, significant actors while uh, we are analyzing contemporary China-Africa relations. Last but not least, I'd like to uh, maybe highlight some institutional challenges in Zambia when dealing with China. So we talk a lot about China, but what does Zambia really want? What are the visions of the Zambian? Um, if China is so important, um, does Zambia have a coherent China strategy? And I'm afraid the answer is no. Um, I have spoken or interviewed many Zambian officials in the past seven years, and I really do not see that. I'd like to quote one of my interviewees words here. And so he said that Zambian ruling elites are short termists while dealing with China and pushing diversification need long term strategy, so they don't bother. In 2019, I did some field work in Zambia along with Dr. Dominic Kompinski and Dr. Andrew Polis and the late Professor Ian Taylor. And we were focusing on the spillover effects of Chinese FDI in Zambia. We spoke to a number of Zambian ministers and also Zambian researchers, journalists, and also scholars. And what we found during our field work is that Zambian institutions that are supposed to regulating, monitoring, and facilitating foreign investors are in fact understaffing and underfinancing. 
they are very ineffective in meeting their mandates and the objectives. For example, the major Zambian institutions, uh, which uh, was established for the sake of FDI spillover creation, is ZDA, uh, Zambian Development Agency. And ZDA is basically unable to fulfill its functions due to the very low budget. They've only got around 3 million quarter in 2019, and they have no presence outside Lusaka. Its office in Andola, Kitwe, and Livingstone have all been closed down. They have only uh, also got a three person for monitoring the entire country, and none of the Chinese companies we visited uh, were even aware that they're uh, that they were supposed to uh, coordinate with CDA. And our respondents in, at CDA also condemned that the situation when state institutions were used for personal and family benefits. And even government related think tank, ZIPA, uh, uh, it, it basically bases estimates on, uh, on secondary data. For example, when we were asking for some data on Chinese investment in the country and the research researchers at ZEPA actually suggested us to look at uh, sex carries data and because they simply don't have it. So a new patrimonial practice is still uh, very striking on the ground and it has been detrimental to the Zambian economy. And if we take into account the real danger of default and also the neoliberal na narrative of the need to create favorable conditions for FDI, Zambia should have relatively strong institutions which uh, can actually assure investors that the country is predictable, at least in the short and also medium term. But I guess the question is how, um, especially as Zambian is having another election very soon, it's going to uh, have another election August, August this year. So I guess the questions are really uh, what is going to happen after the election? And again, what do the Zambians want? And um, so thank you. I guess I'll end here. Um, questions are very welcome in the Q&A section. Thank you very much, Angui. Uh, Dr. Tally, over to you. Can you hear me? Yeah, we, we can hear you fine. I don't know if you're if you're aiming to share your screen. We can't see. We can see your camera, but not your your slides. Uh, just a minute. There we go. We can see a slide as well. Excellent. Oh. You can see them. all right. Momentarily, they they, they disappeared again. Uh, so I don't know uh, what could be the issue. They're back. We can see them. They're back. Yeah. Okay. So, but it's refusing to move. Okay. Can you see now? Yes, we can. We can know. see. We yes. can see. All right. All right. Thank you. Thank you, organizers, for organizing this uh, uh, webinar. Um, it's my pleasure to make a brief presentation on uh, China in Kenya, and I want to start by giving a brief context of China in Kenya, uh, an engagement that has um, taken place since. Kenya attained independence in 1963. And to help us appreciate this context, I will I begin by recognizing that uh, since 1963, under the first leadership of Kenya, uh, the engagement of China in this country has actually followed a standard template of China-Africa relation. And just like my previous presenter has alluded, uh, China was the fourth uh, country to sign a, a diplomatic a relation with Kenya. And at the height of uh, you know, Cold War happening, China was seen as an alternative uh, to capitalist model of uh, uh, development. But again, the reality of that particular moment um, predisposed our policymakers to indeed appreciate that China offered external source of uh, development finance. But as 
you know, the political reality of uh, newly independent uh, Kenya uh, sort of um, gravitated uh, the political elite towards the West uh, because, you know, Kenya was a Western, uh, you know, colonized by, by British and, and therefore uh, Western colonial legacy made it difficult for China to penetrate Kenya's political economy. Uh, this is not to say that China did not make any inroad. Indeed, at that particular time, you know, China will offer a little assistance here to build a hospital here, a road there, and so forth. And again, uh, the, the, the diplomatic uh, role uh, just lasted briefly uh, up to March 1963. And uh, from there, there was, um, there was, you know, a tension between the two countries. And so, uh, we will see relations going down all the way up to 1978, when the two countries uh, coincidentally experienced political trans uh, transition. So when the new leadership um, took place in 1978 under the leadership of the late Daniel Arap Moy, uh, the revival, you know, the, 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 new, the new president revived the, the, the relation and we'll see now a high state visits uh, on both sides. Uh, China and Kenya entered into several uh, technical and economic agreement. We'll also see a number of uh, Chinese, Chinese company, uh, you know, uh, began operation in Kenya as early as 1984. But it's also important to note at this particular time that the implementation of Chinese infrastructure project at that particular uh, point tended to follow you know, the African politics dynamic, the neo-patrimonial logic in the sense that a Chinese a project will favor a certain region are uh, inclined towards the leadership of the countries. It's also important to note that as, as Kenya implemented the structural adjustment program under the neoliberal, neoliberal reform, um, this actually opened the country to significant influx of Chinese exports. Now, a number of Kenyans will be able to export, uh, you know, uh, cheaply manufactured products from from Kenya. And at this particular point, the we also witnessed a high level engagement at political level, uh, exchange in political parties, a military exchange. And towards, you know, the end of that century, Kenya was among. Uh, the countries that attended the inception meeting of AFOCAC in August uh, 2000. Now, when the leadership, uh, when Mwai Kibaki uh... I don't know if we've lost Oscar completely yet. <laughs> I assume that's not just for me. No, we also we we can't hear him as well. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I think Oscar is uh, is disconnected. What I suggest we do is we uh, we continue on to our next speakers, Simona and David, and hopefully when Oscar's back, um, we can we can go back to his presentation. Um, it might take him a bit of a while to disconnect. Is that okay, uh, David and, and Simona? Yes, that's fine. Um, we're going to need to um, we're going to need to move uh, Oscar's uh, screen share. Ah, just like magic. So um, yeah, sorry about that. We'll we will we'll try and get Oscar back. Um, but um, in the meantime, uh, we'll, we'll we'll move on to David and Simona. Okay, so um, can you see my um, my uh, yes. screen? Yes, we can. Excellent. Okay, I'll put myself up as well. Ah, oh, can you still see it? Not only can we see the slides, but we can also see you. Um, so it's the best of both worlds. Kind of. Okay, all right, so uh, now for something slightly different. Um, so Simona and I are going to talk about India in West Africa. 
Um, we wanted to first thank uh, Lucy Scott for digging deep in the desk research and we wanted to thank the Margaret Anstey Centre as well for providing us some funds which so far we've been mostly unable to use for, for obvious reasons. Um, now there has been a, as everybody knows, a huge increase in Indian presence in Africa and in West Africa uh, since the mid-2000s and we tried to capture that in our uh, 2018 article about Ghana. But here we wanted to find out how large Indian influence was uh, across the whole of West African states and during the last 10 years. Now what we do know is that there is a large Indian business presence, so companies like Airtel, Tata, Mahindra and oil companies, um, <clears throat> and uh, there is a fairly large Indian community in some countries, so uh, up to 10,000 in Ghana and 50,000 in Nigeria but it is primarily the Indian state that we are interested in here. So the talk has been split into two. Uh, the first one, the first part I'm going to do, which is the arguments for a significant Indian presence, and then uh, uh, Simone is going to actually argue uh, against that, and she's going to come to a conclusion at the end where breaking down that presence into uh, Indian capacity, visibility, and then the reception by um, by uh, um, uh, African countries, sorry, West African countries. <clears throat> Total statistics, uh, as I think Hangwei said, are about China are unreliable. Um, even the well-known uh, ten billion dollars that India promised to uh, as loans to 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 Africa in 2015, even that is uh, unreliable as well. Hence, we have adopted a more qualitative view. Uh, across political, cultural and economic realms. So starting that then, the on, on politics and diplomacy, uh, two Indian presidents have visited uh, West Africa and uh, visited in total five countries over the last 10 years, and vice presidents have visited a further three. Uh, these countries have included Ghana, Cote d'Ivoire and Nigeria. Um, on the flip side of that, most Af West African countries have sent presidents, or they did send presidents, to the uh, IAFS, the Indian Africa Forum, in 2015. Uh, and if they didn't send presidents, they sent prime ministers. And there were, there were the first ever state visits from Benin, Mali and Liberia to India. So there's quite a bit of uh, diplomatic and political activity there. Secondly, uh, in terms of cult more cultural elements or perhaps soft power, India has been very keen in trying to project uh, or promote yoga in West Africa. But one thing it certainly hasn't had to put any effort into is Bollywood, which remains uh, very popular uh, in many West African states. But perhaps here the more interesting, more recent uh, development is the planned Mahatma Gandhi International Convention Centres. This has been described as Delhi entering China's turf. Now. There are four in the pipeline in West Africa, in Togo, Burkina Faso, the Gambia and Liberia. And the first one has just been opened in Niger. Um, and this was uh, built with a, 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 an Indian grant, not a loan on this occasion, Indian grant. Um, and the other, there will be grants available for all the others. Uh, so far in Niger, the AU summit, summit and the IOC summit have already been held there. Oh, now I want to be able to show you that picture, um, but for some reason, ah, here we go. There it is. There is the uh, first the Mahatma Gandhi International Convention Centre in Niger. I would like to see that at some stage. OK, but the perhaps the biggest splash is economic. Uh, this is in terms of other grants, in terms of lines of credit. Uh, in terms of buyer's credit, uh, and in terms of projects, and in terms of Indian companies. So first of all then, India has been involved in a number of uh, small-scale donations of things like medicines, rice, agricultural equipment, uh, computers, TV cameras, peacekeeping equipment, barracks, buses, fire engines, e-rickshaws, and the list goes on. But probably more importantly is the uh, lines of credit. Now, all West African states beyond Guinea-Bissau and Cape Verde um, have, have had, ex had LOCs extended to them, 
Um, uh, in the case of Senegal, over 300 million worth of LOCs, uh, and across a very wide-ranging uh, arena. So, from electrification to very much the, in, the, in the current day, solar projects, farming, health, factories, etc. And there have been some significant uh, completed projects, including the Tema and Pagadan Railway in Ghana, which we understand is nearly finished, the tractor assembly plant in Benin, uh, the National Assembly, assembly Building in the Gambia, and the Mahatma Gandhi IT and Biotechnology Park in Cote d'Ivoire, to name just a few. And then, of course, there is the presence now of quite a few African countries who are, on the, are benefiting from these LOCs because the LOCs, the loans, are um, most often tied to uh, uh, one or more Indian companies. And the tale here of uh, Shapurji Palonji is uh, worth uh, mentioning. So they started by um, uh, constructing the presidential uh, palace in Ghana. And uh, this was completed in 2008. Um, it was problematic in the sense that it went way over budget and it was used as a political football by Ghanaian politicians. But still, um, Shapurji Palonji came out of this quite well. Um, it was described to us at one point that this was a uh, market entry for Shapurji Palonji, and so it turned out. They are now uh, in 10 West African countries, and they built the uh, National Assembly in the Gambia, and were very much part of building the biotechnology park in Cote d'Ivoire. So uh, a great expansion there for this company. Now, India has been involved in other activities, though so they've been involved in training um, West Africans in India, and they are also heavily involved in the UN missions in Cote d'Ivoire and in Liberia. But I want to finish this bit by talking about COVID. At the end of February 2021 this year, Ghana became the first country in Africa to receive AstraZeneca vaccines through the COVAX system. Crucially, produced by the Serum Institute of India and delivered free of charge by India. Uh, Nigeria, Cote d'Ivoire and the Gambia then followed very quickly afterwards. So India was actually doing well on the uh, vaccine diplomacy stakes and living up to its name as the world pharmacy. So quite a significant presence. I'll now hand over to uh, Simona to show you another possible angle. <laughs> So yes, I would argue perhaps that this is a case for India actually falling short again, uh, showing forward, for instance, in terms of diplomacy and political support. Um, yes, it's true. Modi had an ex under, especially under Modi, there has been an extensive Africa outreach, um, and since 2014, there has been nearly 29 high-level visits from India to Africa, as Dave has just said, from the president, vice president, and prime minister. But Modi has not visited West Africa. He has been elsewhere in Africa, but not in West Africa. So, um, a clear um, importance here. And then there was um, the um, Gandhi statute controversy in Ghana in 2016, which dragged on until 2018, uh, which had very important international and negative repercussions vis-a-vis uh, -vis, uh, with regards to New Delhi and India. Um, and when it comes instead to the political support of India and global, in global institutions, that we find that, found that only Benin and, and Liberia had been explicit in the support of India's bid for a permanent seat in the UN Security Council. But that is not just a diplomatic and political support that is lacking or uh, disappointing. But there have been also problems with India's LOCs, which are, you know, these lines of credit, the main instrument of cooperation and investment, uh, of, uh, Indian investment in Africa. First, they are tied. They are tied to Indian companies, specifically, you know, that's the case of Shapurji Palunji that was just mentioned. Although it is true that Indian uh, companies employed in such a way do employ local workers uh, and also in some cases also subcontract uh, local um, companies as well. But there are also additional problems with LOCs. Few of them, quite a few in fact, are languishing on the shelves. And it, but it's not just uh, about delays, but also about bad policy and plans and design. So for instance, from the sugar factory in Ghana, but it's still not operational five years after its completion. 
It never operated as expected, uh, mired in controversy, political controversy, and now uh, is, is going to be relaunched um, uh, with new partners and strategic, strategic investors. And then we had a fertilizer project, again in Ghana, uh, which was uh, supposed to use gas to manufacture fertilizer, but it hasn't started yet due to shortage of gas. Or the tomato processing plant in Burkina Faso started in 2010, but which is still waiting that reopening uh, after the involvement of the Minister of Commerce. And finally, the tractor assembly plant built in Benin with an Indian LOC using the Indian company Angelic International. This company at the moment is blacklisted by the World Bank, accused of fraud. So what does it all mean? So on the one hand, as Dave said, there has been an attempt at recalibrating India's relationship with Africa, especially since Modi took office in 2014. There's a significant presence, but there is also persistent problems of capacity, visibility, perception, and therefore influence. In terms of capacity, so let me take one or, um, all of this one at a time. In terms of capacity, when uh, David and I were in Delhi a few years ago, we were given an amusing comment about capacity, India capacity. And India capacity was described as a six horse carriage of ambition and a one horse carriage of capabilities. And this is true, we believe, about both India's diplomatic abilities and its administrative ones, of which more in a minute. In terms of diplomatic abilities, it, India's diplomatic core is notoriously small. There has been a recent recruitment drive. So under Narendra Modi's government, Indian missions in Africa are expected to expand from 29 to 47, um, meaning a, sort of a 60% increase of India's diplomatic presence in, uh, in Africa. So this signal a strong commitment on the part of New Delhi to strengthen its link with the continent and also with this Indian diaspora there. But still, the, the India's diplomatic core is stretched and understaffed. Then, in terms of visibility, uh, Lucy, um, our great desk researcher, found it difficult to find commentary and data on India's presence beyond the official Ministry of External Affairs reports. But it was not too difficult to find commentary in China. So this is an interesting. Uh, different uh, difference between India's and China's presence in the continent that needs uh, some attention. And then when it comes to reception, it seems that this depends very much on India's capacity to bridge the gap between its commitments and its implementation of its LOC's fund project. So delivering, because crucially delivering projects on time and reliability of its project necessarily will increase India's potential uh, effect, sorry, the potential effect of India's cooperation and, and it will create goodwill. The various problems incurred by India's LOCs, which some of which I mentioned earlier, suggest that New Delhi is actually struggling with this. And to be fair, actually there have been changes, there have been changes in LOC policies since 2015, specifically to address some of these issues and in response of Africa's criticism and complaints about delays and the lack of completions of several projects. And since then, Indra, India has introduced more scrutiny, monitoring as well, more um, competitive tendering. But clearly, these issues are not completely solved yet. And lastly, this has obviously, all this has obviously repercussions to India's image and soft power and influence. And the last point I want to make in regards um, India soft the, the COVID point just mentioned, made by David Harris. India's soft, diplomat, soft power diplomatic effort, I think, at the moment is laying in tatters, and I'm referring here to India's vaccine diplomacy. Now, till maybe a couple of weeks ago, maybe three weeks ago, India could present itself, as Dave has just said, as the nation, as the pharmacy of the world, a nation that the entire world was looking at expectantly for its vaccine supplies. In fact, in January, it launched this vaccine matri, this vaccine friendship initiative, a major diplomatic effort that they was described to gift and supply made in India vaccine to low income and developing countries. But now with a second uh, COVID wave that is ravaging the country, uh, the situation has changed dramatically. The Serum Institute has come under pressure to provide vaccines for the domestic market and is currently even struggling to get uh, supplies and material, key materials from the United States. 
So New Delhi has put a temporary hold on its exports. But China is continuing to hold its position in this vaccine diplomacy turf, let's say. So what should have been a moment of crowning glory for Indian soft power has become a sad embarrassment. And in addition to this, the Indian Africa Forum Summit, the fourth Indian African Forum Summit, was, was supposed to be held in, in 2020, had, for COVID reason, had to be pushed back to 2022. So this means that seven years after the very successful 2015 one, and so the conclusion that one can draw is in terms of in influence uh, from India, is India losing momentum in Africa once again? Thank you so much, Simona. Thank you, David, as well. Um, in, uh, what I'd like to do is just to see if Oscar is, is, is back with us. Um, if not, we will go straight to Professor Anand's presentation. But Oscar, are you, are you, in, are you in the hood? Are you, <laughs> are you yeah, able to present? Sorry, sorry for that. Uh, I lost uh, because of connectivity. But I'm it back. happens. No apologies needed. Are you able to, to share your screen, perhaps? Um, just a moment. Excellent. Is this showing now? Yeah, we can see it. It's not on. It's not on slideshow. It's not on full screen, um, but we can see your slides. Perfect. Yeah. Yeah. Please go ahead. Thank you. So you 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 allow me to begin from start? It's entirely up to you. If you if you if you want to just quickly to go over those first points, that that's perfectly fine. Yeah. 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 All right. Uh, thank you, and and sorry for you know connectivity issues. Now, I began by saying that um, to understand China and Kenya, it's important also to make appreciation of the context of engagement, a, a context that um, I, I have uh, categorized in what, in terms of uh, the regimes, Kenya's regimes, now, looking at the first Kenya's president, Jomo Kenyatta, and we, I make an appreciation that uh, since 1963, uh, Kenya's engagement in Kenya has actually, uh, China's engagement in Kenya has actually followed the standard template of China-Africa relation. And of course, China was also among the first uh, countries to enter into diplomatic uh, relation, being the fourth. Uh, fourth one in this country. And at that particular time, at the height of uh, you know, Cold War rivalry between the East and West, uh, China was perceived as offering alternative capitalist model of development. And of course, the foreign uh, policy makers um, you know, uh, alive to non-alignment movement thought it wise to diversify sources of development uh, finance, and therefore, China will come in, you know, offer finances, uh, build a school, build a hospital here and there. But of course, uh, what really made it uh, difficult for China to uh, penetrate Kenya's political economy seen at that particular time was the Western colonial uh, legacy, of course, uh, you know, uh, Kenya being a, a British uh, colony. Now, diplomatic ties uh, went low uh, from March and uh, you know less engagement uh, ensued lasting up to 1978 when the two countries coincidentally uh, experienced a uh, political um, uh, political the experience political uh, transition now when daniel arap moy uh, you know uh, uh, took over power um we he revived a relation, and we'll actually see high-level visits on both sides. Uh, the two countries entered into several technical and economic agreement that will now see, uh, you know, Chinese uh, players, mainly Chinese state enterprises like uh, CBRC, uh, you know, coming on board as early as 1984. Suffice to note that um, implementation of Chinese infrastructure project will also follow neopatrimonial uh, logic. 
uh, in the sense that we will see a China, you know, rather the implementation of the project, you know, uh, intentionally, uh, you know, going within certain regions uh, of the country. Now, with the implementation of a structural adjustment program and, you know, the whole, you know, economic, uh, macroeconomic reform, we'll see Kenya open up to significant influx of Chinese export. And therefore, from that particular uh, time, the trade relation between China and Kenya increasingly uh, favored uh, China. Within that period, there was also high level engagement at political, uh, political level, mainly in form of military and political uh, exchange. It's also important to note that um, as, as, as 20th, 20th century uh, crossed and uh, you know, at the turn of um, the new century, Kenya was among the key players at the inception of uh, FOCAC uh, meeting in, in, in August. In fact, Kenya was among the key players that, um, that influenced the formation of uh, uh, FOCAC. Now, the leadership that took place uh, at the turn of 21st century uh, came at a time when Kenya's development finance was all low, mainly from devel uh, traditional development partners, and there was concerted attempt to diversify sources of development finance. And so China, having showed interest in Africa, this naturally provided a uh, you know, window of opportunity uh, for Kenya to diversify uh, you know, new sources, which will now later be coined as look east policy. And from that particular point, then uh, the, the, the new political elite will now start appreciating the presence of China and quickly, uh, you know, went in to uh, implement a one China policy that now we see, you know, increased interaction between Kenya and China, mainly beginning with um, uh, implementation infrastructure projects, mainly uh, in road subsector, telecommunication subsector, uh, energy and port. But this gradually expanded to other uh, other subsectors, uh, for example, uh, real estate like housing, uh, agriculture, and, and and of course trade and uh, trade and and wholesale. And this will also now see. Uh, you know, in terms of uh, migration of Chinese uh, workers and, you know, other Chinese businessmen coming to uh, Kenya to, you know, uh, to engage in various uh, activities. Of course, implementation of infrastructure project was in line uh, with the, you know, broad China's action plan as envisioned uh, in, uh, you know, the outcome of FOCAC, but mainly uh, targeting to connect African uh, country through, you know, uh, regional integration. Uh, from that particular uh, point, uh, that that thinking coincided very well uh, with Kenya's ambition, you know, of implementing a uh, region-centric infrastructure project. And we'll see uh, Kenya come up with a mega project like uh, uh, Lapset infrastructure, for example, as you can see. Uh, this project was in line with the, you know, China's thinking within the uh, FOCAC framework to enhance a regional integration, uh, connecting east part of uh, the continent and the west, uh, western part of the continent. Uh, this project is important because it will actually shape uh, Kenya's interest within a uh, region, uh, within East Africa region, and of course, uh, by extension, you know, shaping it is a uh, political, uh, economic uh, dynamics uh, with other uh, neighboring countries. It's also important to mention that even though this project, uh, uh, project was not financed by, uh, by China, but the mere fact that the implementation of this project uh, has been uh, overseen by Chinese company that in a way has also offered opportunity uh, for China to extend its uh, engagement uh, in the country. Now, uh, uh, turning to the, to the current regime, Uhuru Kenyatta's regime, 
uh, he built on the foundation laid by uh, his predecessors, uh, Moi uh, Kibaki. And um, when he attained, uh, when he had, he came to power uh, in, uh, in in 2013. Uh, five months down the line, he made his uh, state maiden state visit in China, and of course, uh, the visit was mainly influenced by you know the talks revolving implementation of one of the major uh, largest infrastructure projects since independence. This is a standard uh, gauge railway, and this implementation of this project uh, came at a very opportune moment when China had just incepted uh, Belt and Road Initiative. And so it became natural to, you know, to incorporate uh, this project within the BRI uh, framework. And we will now see uh, fast tracking as far as the initial talks and um, disbursement of funds and, of course, implementation. Uh, uh, you know, uh, beginning uh, immediately. However, concerns uh, were raised over um, the economic viability of, of this uh, project, given that it was actually running parallel uh, to the traditional uh, railway system that uh, was uh, put in place by, you know, colonial masters. Other concerns, of course, related to the economic viability, debt sustainability, and economic um, economic <clears throat> hazards. So, as you can see on um, on that uh, slide that I'm sharing, uh, the initial thinking around the implementation of uh, SGR was to link Kenya and its neighboring countries, uh, mainly Uganda, Rwanda, and and South Sudan. And of course, uh, given that the project um, will begin from the Kenyan side. Kenya was given uh, that mandate to begin implementing it is uh, to, to, to begin implementing on its, its its side from Mombasa to Nairobi from Nairobi to uh, Kisumu and so on. So far, uh, Mombasa, Nairobi up to na uh, past Naivasha, Narok, which is phase one and and bit of phase two, has already uh, been completed. But of there have been concern that, um, of course, given that um, I was thinking about uh, the desire to have, you know, uh, port authority provide adequate um, stock uh, to, uh, to to the, you know, railway um, uh, railway transit. That has not really, uh, you know. A transition to the much desired uh, out, out, output as far as uh, as far as the revenue generation is concerned, and there has been a lot of concern over uh, you know repayment of uh, of um, the debt, uh, given that uh, you know the digits that have been provided by by Kenya Railway sorry by by Kenya Revenue Authority uh, indicates that um, you know. The, Kenya Railway Corporation is really struggling uh, to accumulate adequate uh, stock to have, uh, you know, uh, repayment, repayment as, as initially uh, planned. And so because of that concern, there has been, you know, debate nationally and internationally over a, a potential, you know, uh, debt uh, repayment issues. As you have, uh, as you have had uh, cases, for example, uh, as 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 Hangwe has has talked about, uh, you know, in Zambia, we have had cases from uh, Sri Lanka, and so uh, there has been that fear about uh, a repayment plans. However, uh, it's also important to note that despite the despite the concern, uh, and of course. Uh, COVID dynamic setting in uh, as as late last year 20, 2020 and early this year, uh, China and Kenya have actually got into an agreement to re to relook into the repayment plan in the context of the challenges that have been brought uh, forward, so that then uh, the country can uh, you know have some you know financial uh, flexibility. As far as the repayment of uh, of uh, debt is concerned, as we are speaking, 
uh, China is uh, the leading lender of uh, Kenya's, um, you know, development finance. You know, uh, in terms of uh, in terms of uh, looking at the loan, looking at the loan, and of course uh, the Chinese Chinese loan, the Chinese loans in this country. Uh, if you look at the number that uh, that uh, have been provided by China China Africa Research Institute. Kenya is uh, number six of African countries, top African countries that uh, have acquired a, a significant uh, Chinese uh, Chinese loan. So those are the dynamics that uh, are, that that have characterized uh, China in Africa in 21st century, and we'll be discussing uh, you know more more issues. Uh, during the plenary, back to back to the moderator. Thank you so much, Oscar. We'll move straight along to uh, Professor Anand, and then we'll go to Q and A. Thank you. Can I share my screen? Yeah, we can see it. Great. Can you see in presentation? Not yet. Yeah, it's uh, it's there in full screen. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. And after those fantastic uh, and detailed presentations, I'm going to take a slightly different tack, uh, but I'm hoping that it is still connected to some of the issues already raised. Um, I'm Bibi Anand, uh, uh, and it's a real pleasure to, to be part of this um, uh, new initiative. Uh, as the, the chair has mentioned, we had the football relationship with, uh, with the Kings, uh, but uh, to have this intellectual kind of uh, um, f discussions, I think is, is a new uh, new chapter and I'm very, very excited with this and thanks to David and Kieran for our getting, you know, getting this go ahead. Um, okay, uh, an unashamed uh, uh, publicity, but I think it's relevant. Um, it's uh, our book has just been published earlier uh, last month. This is the Handbook of BRICS and Emerging Economic Economies with uh, Oxford University Press. It's a collaborative project. Uh, over 60 authors uh, from various countries uh, contributed to the 43 or so chapters. So what I'm going to speak to you is not about the book. You can read all about the book. But in the process of doing the book, uh, I have spent uh, considerable time looking at BRICS and thinking about BRICS themselves. And also in the past, I have done uh, over seven years, 2007 to 2014, uh, I have uh, worked very closely with the China Development Bank, trying to build their own capacity for uh, thinking about and delivering uh, pr projects. So in the process, try to understand a little bit about China's approach to thinking about uh, investments, especially with the China Development Bank, um, and also had a brief opportunity to present some of that to the Africa All Party Parliamentary Group um, on uh, China's role in Africa. So I take a long historical perspective. So I'm an economist, I'm not a political scientist. So my tools and uh, theories are slightly different, but I'm sh still sure that there are a lot of things that uh, we discuss are still relevant. So I'm very, I'm always interested in trying to understand how economic development gets triggered and how economic development and transition actually takes place. In that, in some respects, my kind of uh, source of inspiration is uh, Arthur Lewis. Um, Lewis does a lot of reflection and he himself was based in Manchester when he was doing some of that kind of reflection. Um, and we are based in Bradford, which is very much a product of the Industrial Revolution in some ways, the later part of the Industrial Revolution, if you like. Um, but when trying to understand, you know, the emergence of BRICS and also the kind of relationships with Africa, I think this historical perspective may uh, give us some insights. So in the context of Industrial Revolution, we know that uh, there are a lot of debates. Um, some people even don't like the word industrial revolution and others who accept it, you know, there have been a lot of discussions on what were the most important factors 
and in a long discussion uh, with the historian, uh, prof economic historian, Professor Martin Danton, who also contributed a chapter in, in, in our book, um, we figured out almost 10, 12 reasons and we could uh, continue. But I think some of the important issues are whenever a country is trying to uh, kind of uh, achieve economic development, how it can overcome some of the constraints, I think is that's where the strategy is. The constraints we know are things such as, you know, you want to expand agriculture because you have to achieve food self-sufficiency uh, and for that agriculture can be cru can be you know really crucial and uh, in order to do that um, either you can develop very good relationships with another country and uh, in, through that process you can import otherwise you know food self-sufficiency seems to be an important crucial factor uh, so land becomes an important factor in 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 that kind of economic development uh, related to that is the labor, um, the usual economic kind of uh, staples, land, labor, capital kind of things. You can mention that. Um, so in industrial revolution, we know that land constraint, you know, England, the United Kingdom itself is, is a relatively a small country in terms of land area, but the expansion ex and uh, colonialism, if you like, and new colonies uh, enabled England to relax the constraint of land to the significant extent that a lot of uh, production of cotton or any other raw material needed for the industrial revolution to take place could, could take place and land was no longer a constraint. And to some extent, food, I think, for, uh, during its structural change, England never suffered food shortages predominantly because there was sufficient kind of arrangement to import foods from this expanded production. Uh, labor, again, in the case of you know the historical past is, is murky. Uh, it's very painful, but I think it's reality. Um, some of the labor constraint was was relaxed through slavery uh, and also in the indentured labors in later part of the 19th century. Um, so we know that through this, we know about the North Atlantic triangular trade of uh, ships. You know, we read about in, in, in earlier parts of the history about ships, you know, traveling from Africa to Europe to North America as part of the raw material, slaves, and uh, manufactured uh, commodities kind of a trade. So a similar kind of a triangle, there is also a land triangle. Um, so that is perhaps uh, Europe, uh, India, and China. So that kind of a triangle, opium and tea are very much part of that. And, and then we also look at Asimoglu and Robinson argument, uh, argument uh, in terms of the extractive institutions, nature of institutions. So even after, 20, 30, 40 years after independence, why institutions and governance arrangements in countries remain uh, locked in certain directions and incentives remain you know, in a certain way. I think a very good example of that is also not only institutions, but in infrastructure can also be significantly biased by these historical paths and path dependence. So for example, in the case of India, the predominant commercial city, Mumbai, um, it did not even exist uh, about 200 years ago. It, it, it is a completely a product of uh, uh, colonialism and uh, industrial industrialization in, in, in England, if you like. And so it was part of the raw material hub and the infrastructure created gave Bombay that preeminence as a port and also as a railway hub, then that ena enabled it to remain uh, in, in that kind of a position. So these are kind of very important examples. So we can begin to kind of understand some of the challenges that African countries faced from say 1950 to 2000, as they were becoming independent, they still had to overcome many of these constraints, overcome the problem of land, of capital um, and uh, labor perhaps to less extent, but it is also an issue, I'll come back to this. And most importantly, in terms of you know overcoming the extractive nature of institutions, and countries who were able to do that in bursts were able to overcome and, and uh, enjoy growth episodes over a short period of time. Otherwise, you know, again, they fall back into that. Uh, and then we have from around 1994 onwards, we have a new kind of emergence taking place. Um, and China, I think in that sense has done uh, quite a lot of uh, in institutional infrastructure development before it really, uh, took to this kind of a global uh, role of uh, financing infrastructures. So the policy banks created in 1994, 
um, laid that kind of a ground and China's own development, I think, was able to, I mean, in case of China, the land constraint was less important. It's a vast country. Um, so achieving food self-sufficiency, I think, was okay. Labor, again, in China's case, you know, largest population, uh, so labor constraint was not there. It is a capital constraint, how China overcame the capital constraint. I think that is a very interesting uh, part of the puzzle that we need to understand. There are other issues, of course, technology, human capability, etc. So these also, I think, work alongside alongside this. Um, in, in developing this kind of a new institutional infrastructure, initially China was not thinking of developing um, those kind of institutions for Africa or other parts, but I think it was trying to overcome its own infrastructure challenge. So that's why these policy banks of which China Development Bank is one became such an important part of uh, the state-led development where the sovereign guarantee of the state is the biggest asset that the China Development Bank could use and then mobilize money from the capital market, which then you can uh, use to uh, invest or fund long-term infrastructure projects. Now, India's case is, is, is much more mixed, much more complex. It's not that straightforward. Um, but coming back to, uh, you know, in, in India's case, land, to some extent, land constraint is not such a serious. India is also fairly large in terms of geographic mass. But food self-sufficiency took quite some time for India, as you all know, the Green Revolution. Uh, before that, 1967, 68, India was very close to starvation, and that's what triggered the Green Revolution. And and by 19 early 1980s, India began to um, move towards food self-sufficiency. But food self-sufficiency was itself not fully achieved until early 1990s. So from that, I think you know uh, that enabled India to focus on industrialization. Labor again in large population, so I don't think that is an issue for India. Uh, capital, I think India took a much slower route to developing capital markets. So the capital markets were not so much as state-led as in the case of uh, China. Therefore, the development banks in case of India, um, I'm at the moment working on a paper, still half finished, a um, long way to go. But uh, in Indian case, we see that in, in the book, uh, Professor John Wise has written a, a chapter on uh, development banks and especially a case study of development bank in Brazil. Uh, so we have the Pandas in case of Brazil, we have the China Development Bank in case of China, but you don't have a single national uh, development bank in case of India. There are various other development banks. Some initially started as development banks and over a period of time, they became commercial banks, changed over completely. Uh, so I think in Indian case, that lack of development bank, a significant development bank, it remains an important uh, constraint. Uh, technology, I think technology and human capability, there is not much difference between this. Okay, so these are individual cases of China and India, but looking at BRICS themselves, uh, uh, obviously there are, let me frame my arguments in twofold. So first looking at BRICS themselves, um, and in the in the book, uh, in the chapter that I have written uh, with, with my co-editors, co um, we spent quite a lot, lot of time uh, looking at the summits, 10 BRICS summits, and trying to understand how thinking has evolved, if at all, etc. So we called it, you know, BRICS summitry. Now, the only one summit that has taken place in Africa, the Durban summit, that has been a very important one. That was the opportunity for BRICS to engage much more um, as a collectively, uh, collectively with Africa. But uh, we see some beginnings of some steps taken. But there is a huge challenge because each of the BRICS nations has uh, its own, if you like, perspective on Africa and relationship with Africa. Uh, that means taking a collective position for BRICS is, is much, much more difficult. It's much easier for BRICS nations to stand together and say something about climate change or say something about sustainability as they did in case of the summits in Brazil or to say something about uh, um, uh, technology or something like that. But to say something about Africa, I think it's much, much more challenging, much more difficult. Um, it, it, we have a further complication in the case of uh, South Africa. If we just look at South Africa, uh, land is, to some extent, it's, 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 it is a constraint. It's not a fully, uh, you know, it's a very important constraint, but it remains a constraint. Labor, I think in case of South Africa, labor constraint 
had to be relaxed by being open and being part of SEDAC, for example, and creating that kind of a, a wider uh, labor pool so that many people can come to South Africa and work uh, if they are not South Africans. Capital constraint, I think, again, is, is, a, is a significant challenge. Uh, technology, human capability, these are somewhat in a, in a middle level kind of constraints. So this kind of creates um, a, a complex uh, playing field, if you like, for each of the BRICS nations, but also BRICS as a, as a collective. And each of them have their own uh, strengths to deal with and where they can trade with Africa. The, of course, we all depend on China to be the manufacturing hub of the world. And therefore, it is natural that therefore China has to secure the raw materials needed for that kind of a manufacturing process. And that led to China to, to see relationship not only with uh, Africa, but also with South America in terms of securing the um, raw material flows uh, in an uninterrupted way became a very important part of the diplomacy. And that led to, in, in some respects, many of these kind of diplomatic initiatives, including the FOCAX that uh, my previous speaker spoke about. But all of this is kind of, was further complicated by the commodity super cycle we saw between 2002 and 2010. And in some respects, that boom also has led to huge opportunities for, um, if you like, um, uh, state capture and also resource nationalism. Uh, we see in many countries that was a time when resource nationalism began to emerge. So in this context, what happens to industrialization in Africa itself? This is a paper I have um, done some work on for the uh, Economic Commission in Africa, um, in Addis. Um, so it, it, it's very interesting to see that industrialization in Africa is complicated. If none of these factors were there, perhaps different countries in Africa would have industrialized differently. Industrialization is crucial in the transition, in the in the kind of Lewis model way of structural transition, because that generates huge amounts of surplus, which can be reinvested to increase productivity and therefore, you know, raise the uh, incomes. Um, and we find that uh, the industrialization process in, in, in Africa has been significantly hampered by the the resources boom and therefore even countries which uh, have very huge amount of natural resources um, whether that skewed the nature of industrialization in, in Africa uh, I think that remains a huge huge kind of challenge and final point is about infrastructure um, infrastructure problem I think you know you you cannot wait to wait for industrialization to take place and then solve infrastructure. I think these two are interconnected. In the case of India, I think this is very visible. So India industrializes at the same time it has infrastructure, both 21st century infrastructure and 17th century infrastructure, both coexisting within a matter of a uh, you know, few square miles of geography. I think that is a huge challenge and this remains to be an important issue for, for, for African industrialization as well. So it is in this context, I think, when we think of BRICS, um, we at the moment we don't have much by way of, you know, there is some literature, but very scant looking at uh, the role of BRICS. BRICS themselves are very quiet. Uh, as we saw in the case of vaccine diplomacy, individual countries are delivering vaccines, but there isn't a BRICS kind of role. So there is a kind of an institutional vacuum. The original purpose of BRICS was to provide greater voice for South, South you know, if you like, uh, emerging economies in the global uh, institutions. But I think more recent developments, including kind of individual relationships between BRICS, BRICS members, uh, it has complicated this journey and slowed down uh, the progress a little bit. So it is in that context, I think, looking ahead, what happens with the BRICS and Africa I think it's 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 too early to to predict, so I will stop there. And thank you very much. I hand over back to back to the chat. Thank you. Thank you very much. I actually ask all of our panelists if they're able to to put their cameras on so we can get another look at those beautiful faces. Um, and what we're going to do is we're going to go through a couple of rounds of questions. And we've already got some great questions um, in the chat. Um, and I will I will ask the three at uh, the first go. Um, if you could answer them 
perhaps it's easiest to answer them in the order in which you presented. So we'll start with Hangui and we'll, we'll finish with Anand. Um, you don't have to necessarily answer each of these questions. If you don't want to comment on one, that's fine. Um, but I'll read the questions out now so the audience uh, knows um, what, what we're asking. I have questions of my own, but actually these are excellent. So um, I will save mine. Um, if we have time, maybe I can raise them. So the first question, um, we have a question from Jean Ramier. What are the similarities and differences